uh, accept it. And now we are on. <laughs> there you go. Hey, man. How you doing, man? Good to see you. Say, man. Thank you so much for being been here. a long time. It has been a long time. 2009, time flies. That's right. I was young and full of hopes. <laughs> you know what's funny is um, I was looking back at your career. You started in 2006 with yeah. the Cubs. And uh, were you in spring training in 2006? I was. I was in spring training with the Cubs in 2006 oh, really? as well. I, I honestly, I think I remember, I think I remember us talking way back then because I knew you were from Italy. And yes. um, yeah, I, I was briefly with the Cubs. I got signed and released out of spring training, but I was there. <laughs> wow, small world, huh? I did small not world. remember that actually. How about that? So I, to I told you that it was going to be easy to get online, right? And First time, it, actually, it, I could not work it, I work think, it out. I think it must have been my fault because I thought I was just going to be able to do this from the computer, and maybe there was something uh, to that. So then I was able to get on with my phone. So I'm, yeah, I'm, the thing, yeah, the thing about Instagram, it's almost everything you can do. Like you can do almost everything on the phone, but it's kind of different with the computer. Yeah, that that might be okay. it. Yeah, man. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, if anybody needs me to translate in Italian, please let me know in the comments. Um, so uh, thanks to Seth Lafera, he's the one that actually uh, remind me about you. And so I want to thank him. And, uh, you know, I just uh, want to have like a bunch of questions actually for you. Uh, I've prepared all the questions in the past few days. Uh, I'm very curious about a few things. Uh, well, first of all, like, I know that you're in Philadelphia right now. I am. Okay, so I was just wondering how's the situation over there with the COVID, I mean. Not not way. great. Not yeah. great. We're probably one of the hardest hit states, uh, New oh. York being the worst, and then New Jersey, but it's kind of filtered on into the Philadelphia area. I'm okay. right outside of Philadelphia, but yeah. uh, we're still in quarantine. Uh, nothing's really open uh, i mean you can go to the grocery store and stuff like that but no yeah. bars no restaurants nothing just essential stuff you know bad scene I, I know over in italy you guys got hit even worse than we did um how are things going over there yeah it has been pretty bad i mean uh for a good month and a half uh now it seems like everything is getting better we're going back to, you know, not normal, but like they, they're going to open bars and some of the stuff on Monday. But yeah, yeah. It, has been, it has been pretty crazy, you know, like I basically was at home for two months, just leave the house to go buy grocery. It's pretty, crazy. yeah, pretty crazy times that we're living right now. Uh, I bet it was pretty crazy even, I mean, you were in spring training, now you're a pitching coach for those that not, don't know this, but like, wasn't it pretty weird that, you know, you guys were there preparing or at least thought that you were going to prepare the season and then at some point they just shut it down, huh? We kept, uh, we kept keeping an eye on what was going on. Uh, we obviously knew what was going on in Italy. And yeah. if it had blown up over here, we were, you know, we were going to have to shut down the operations and stuff. We had a closed door meeting uh, a couple days before that happened. Um, and they basically told us for our safety, they're going to send everybody home. We weren't sure if we were just going to stay kind of quarantined in Florida and just continue to practice. I'm actually glad they sent everybody home. Yeah. Because obviously it's been a couple months now and, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be home now. But yeah, it was yeah, a good time. It was, nobody knew what was going on, really. Yeah, man, it's unbelievable. And like, do you, do you actually think they're going to have a season this year? You know what's so funny? I just got off the phone with uh, my boss the, okay. uh, for the Marlins. I just got furloughed. Uh, me and a hundred other staff members for the Marlins just basically got laid off. So um, really, as of right now, yeah, there's no minor league season. Minor league season's canceled. Oh. Um, what they think is going to happen is they're probably going to start bringing minor league players back to Florida when they get the okay, just to keep them moving. But as far as a minor league season, it's been canceled. Major League season just depends on if, uh, you know, the states, the government okays everything. Uh, Players Association has been talking to MLB along with the owners to try to get something resolved, to try to get safety issues um, in place to get the Major League season back, which I think when that's the case, I've heard talk of them expanding rosters from 25 to 30 man. 
Uh-huh. And then having having a 20, uh, I guess, player taxi squad for the big leagues in case somebody gets hurt. So they'll, they'll take probably 20 of their best minor league players and put them in Florida and just practice, play games. And if somebody goes down in the big leagues, just kind Jesus. of fill them up. Yeah. That's so unbelievable. It, it really is. Uh, these are <laughs> these are some interesting times we're in right now. Yeah, and it, like, pretty much hit everybody out of nowhere. So, like, you know, everybody that had plans for this year, even, like, the minor league players, you know, like, you get, in, you get to camp and you're like, you know, this year is going to be my year. Maybe, you know, I'm going to be able to move on and, like, go to a, you know, a better level, blah, blah, blah. And it completely stops. So, I know. Pretty crazy again. Um, well, let's go. Let's go back to your uh, your playing career. Uh, they okay. Say, like, a, a better time uh, for you. You signed out of, uh, out of college, right? I did. I went to Western Carolina University in North Carolina. Okay. Okay. So in 98, you actually signed for the Rockies, right? I did. Okay. And, uh, you were with them for six years, if I'm not wrong. I was, I was, I was in the minor leagues with them for six years, uh, from yeah. 1998. Uh, last year in spring training was 2004, kind of a yeah. mutual, uh, parting of ways, uh, I don't think they saw me making the triple A team that year. I didn't want to go back to double A. So I asked for my release. They granted it to me and then I moved on. I see. I see. Yeah. I read a lot about you in these last few days. Uh, it's actually a pretty long career. You spent a bunch of years in the minors. Uh, Cause then. <laughs> 2000, right yeah. 2004. I saw you went, you went for the, to play for the Royals, then the nationals. You even went to Atlantic league for, you know, a year and a half, almost like that. In independent and independent. Yeah. Yeah, independent ball. And then 2007, actually signed again with the Brewers. Uh, was it, like, pretty tough to, like, every year have to change teams and have to, you know, get adjusted to different organization? It, it was. Uh, you know, the first six years that I was with the Colorado Rockies, uh, they were great. Uh, you, you feel like you found a home. You know, obviously, the team drafted you. Uh, you felt like you found a home there. Then after – you know, a certain time, you know, six years passed. I hadn't made it to the big leagues. I got as high as triple A. I battled through some injuries uh, with my yeah. shoulder. And uh, I guess it was just time to kind of part ways. And then from the 2004 to probably 2007, when I signed with the Brewers, I was just kind of trying to find that same home. And I bounced around a little bit. Uh, the, the Orioles, uh, I got signed by them. I was in Ottawa, Canada that year in triple A. Okay. Um, didn't get an invitation to spring training the next year. So I left and joined the nationals, which was probably a mistake. Okay. <laughs> I probably should have went back to Baltimore, but you know, I did keep bouncing around, but I think I probably should have just stayed with one organization and kind of just built what I built in Colorado thinking the grass was greener and, you know, trusting my own ability. Yeah. I wanted to get to the big leagues. I kept moving around, but then when I, got with the Brewers, they put me in double A and I had been in independent league. So I was like, you know what, I'll just take the affiliate right now. And I, you know, after the 2007 season, didn't get an invitation to spring training, which was fine. Uh, I started the 2008 season uh, healthy and throwing the ball really well. Yeah. And I got called up that year and it just, for the next five and a half years, I had found that family again. So it took a while. But, like, at the same time, like, I was looking at your numbers. Like, you had very good numbers in the minor leagues because uh, 77 wins and 57 losses. And you had a 3.53 year A, which, I mean, is very good. And, like, so, you know, it's pretty tough sometimes. Like, like not all the players receive maybe what they, what they you know, kind of deserve sometimes. Absolutely. You know? Like, 10, 10 seasons like that at, with those, those numbers. My I mean, MO- were you pretty frustrated at that point? I was. My MO was I didn't throw hard enough. I was yeah. a, I was an 88 to 92 guy, sat mm-hmm. like 90, 91, but I could pitch. Like yeah. I could throw my fastball anywhere I wanted to. Yeah. I, I had secondary uh, pitches that I could throw for strikes when I wanted to throw them for strikes. So I kind of, I could pitch, you know what I mean? Like you have yeah. guys today that you go and see, they take the mound, all they want to do is throw hard. I was more of, I always believe that pitching is an art form. Mm-hmm. So when I went out there, I would, I would, you know, use the corners, elevate my fastball, stay to the bottom of the zone, change speeds with my off speed, you know, uh, get ahead with my breaking ball sometimes second, third time through the order. Um, so it was, it was more of an art form for me. And I stayed true to it most of my career. And it took 
10 years for an organization to take a chance on me. And I, and when I got that opportunity, I kind of ran with it. So, yeah, I saw that. Um, how did it feel like after 10 years, like, did you lose hope Do, like along the way or like you lose less faith, I guess. When I ended up, point? when I ended up in independent baseball in 2006, I almost retired. I, I almost yeah. quit. Um, it was what a did tough it, time. What did it make, make you like keep going? Um, you know, family, family yeah. was, was always by my side, you know, telling yeah. me I can do it. I think belief in myself, uh, knowing that, you know, I've had good careers along the way. And they always say that this game will dictate when you need to retire. You know, mm -hmm. the hitters, will, the hitters will let you know. And, uh, I've always had success. So yeah. I, I believed in myself. What, what I, what I would do was every winter, I would go back down to either Mexico or Venezuela. I played five okay. winners in Mexico, Venezuela. And I would face some of the, you know, the toughest hitters in the game when they were preparing, you know, for spring training. Yeah. So down in Mexico, like a lot of big leaguers were down there and I would kind of gauge myself off of them. And I had success. And uh, I was just like, I just need to be with the right organization. It's all yeah. about timing, right place, right time. And it yeah, I mean, out for me in you, you were having success. You were probably in your mind. You were like, I can do this. Like, why don't, <laughs> why don't everybody else see that? Right. Right. Uh, I, we have a few comments. There's a guy that actually, you probably know him. His name is Num something. He said, new 4261. It says you're the best pitching coach in the game. So it's probably one <laughs> of your guys. <laughs> It was one of my guys. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. Uh, so you were saying you were uh, successful, like talking about that. 2009, uh, you know, you get the, the experience after that you're big league call up, you get the experience to pitch with the Italian national team. That's where we actually met. Right. Uh, how was that? Like, it was just the second edition of the WBC. Was it like, was it tough for you to say yes? Or, you know, because you're in big league spring training, blah, 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 or... I actually took a huge gamble uh, playing mm -hmm. for Team Italy. I was in the big leagues the year before, in uh, 2008. Yeah. I was on the 40-man roster, right. and I was in camp, and I was basically battling for a uh, position in the bullpen. So I remember Milwaukee coming to me and saying, listen, like, we're not going to tell you not to go, but just so you know, <laughs> you know, this could affect you making the team, this and that, da, da, da. And – I really wanted to play. I really, yeah. I, I thought it would only be a win-win for me if I went and pitched against, say, I ended up pitching against Venezuela. Yeah, really. an unbelievable lineup. If I performed well, that could only look good for me. Yeah. Uh, but if I didn't, then that could be a strike against me as well. So, you yeah. know, I, I laid it all out on the line. I, I believed in myself and I kind of went for it. And I'm actually glad I did because I, I really believe uh, that environment helped me make that team out of spring training and, and, and make my first opening day roster. Yeah, 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 and you did. I remember you pitched four scoreless innings, like you said, against a pretty good that was lineup. That was a tough <laughs> team. <laughs> oh, man, yeah, they, they, they ended up, like, getting a few hits when you actually left the game. I know. Uh, but, yeah, you had, a, you had a very good season after that, too, with the Brewers, uh, 51 innings, uh, 48 Ks, and only 15 walks. And six of them were intentional intentional walks. Um, right. So you were saying you were always pretty good with control. Right. How do you pitch with control? Like, I know you're a pitching coach now. I know you, you, you probably see a lot of guys that struggle with control. Right. Like, how do you, how do you teach that or how do you work on that? Do, do you, I, I always hmm. talk to my players about knowing who you are as a, yeah. as a pitcher. Once you figure that out, then everything else kind of falls into place. I knew I wasn't going to overpower guys. Yeah. I knew that I would live on the corners, uh, command the bottom of the zone, uh, shoot the top of the zone every now and then with my fastball, you know, ahead in the count, just to kind of change up eye, eye level to work off the breaking ball. We call it tunneling now. You know, there's all these analytic terms, but we yeah. had all that stuff, you know, back in the day that we, we just did. So if you know what type of pitcher you are and you – and you are really in tune with your delivery, mentality, everything. You can control your body, you can control your, your glove, your front side, you can control your head. If you can control your delivery, you can throw the ball anywhere you want to. Mm -hmm. It's not being overly aggressive. I remember, uh, you know, I, I read uh, stories all the time. Leo Mazzoni, who was yeah. a pitching coach for the Atlanta Braves back in the day when he had Smoltz, Glavin, and Maddox, uh, he would always say that pitchers – getting loose for the game first couple innings of the starting pitcher 
uh, they would go probably 85 to 90 percent um, intensity working on location, uh, changing speeds, you know, first, probably even second time through saving a little in the tank. So I was never really a max effort guy. Okay. So my 90, 91 miles an hour was probably 90, 95 percent. And when I had to reach back, maybe O2 or you know, something in an advantage count, I could touch the 93s, 94s, but I didn't, I didn't live there. I didn't, I didn't pitch with it. So I would, I would basically, you know, have command over velocity sometimes, I think, and movement per se, you know, we talk yeah, about yeah. movement in the game. Now, you know, you have the, uh, the X and Z break horizontal and vertical. Um, if you are a real max effort guy, what happens is your fastball flattens out. It doesn't move as much. I mean, you can mm -hmm. talk about finger pressure and everything, but just manipulating your body and or arm slot can make the ball move. But I think, you know, going at that effort level that's comfortable for you to help, you know, maintain your delivery through your delivery helps with command movement and all that stuff. So knowing, knowing who you are and how you pitch is, is very crucial. Yeah. You used to work on your mechanic a lot. Like, I did. I did. Yeah. I didn't do a lot of flat work or uh, dry work though. I was, uh, mm -hmm. I always believed that, uh, throwing more helps you know what i mean yeah i, I did yeah. a, i did a thing with the marlins and we talked about the magic uh 110 pitches uh in a game that's that you know it seems like major league baseball for starting pitchers in the big leagues okay you know, they're capped out at 110 well if you look back into the 90s and even before that guys were averaging 130 140 pitches per game as starting pitchers mm -hmm. um and we've kind of whether it be from injury or you know, now that our bullpens are what they are, you know, you have seventh inning, eighth inning, ninth inning, closing guys yeah. that make just as much money as the starters. So you, you only have those guys going five, six innings, but, um, you know, throw more, you know what I mean? It's like, I always went out, I played catch, I long tossed. And when I got off the mound, I'd throw 35 to 40 bull, uh, pitch bullpens just to maintain that, that good feel. I'd throw okay. a flag on every once in a while just to work on timing but just master your craft, master your craft. Yeah. So one more question. Um, when, when you were on the mound during the game, were you thinking about your mechanic or was it more just like a Not at all. You have to have two mindsets when, when, yeah. you, when, you, when you pitch, really. There's, uh, there's the game mindset that you take yeah. out, out to the field where you don't think about practice. And then mm -hmm. when you throw your bullpen during that training mindset, you're allowed to think about delivery. You're allowed to think about separation and timing where your foot strike is, is your arm up in the back? Do you want a little bit shorter? Guys are starting to get a little bit shorter um, in their arm swings uh, for whatever reason. I think weighted balls has a lot to do with that as well. Yeah. But um, there's time for working on your delivery, and then there's time when you take the mound, you're, you're, you're in com compete mode. You're right. not really thinking about anything about uh, but that hitter and, and where you're trying to throw the ball. So, yeah, yeah. That's basically it. You got to take all that other stuff out of there. Makes sense, man. Oh, going back to your like playing career, then 2010, you actually got injured. Huh? It was a pretty big injury that rotator cuff. Rotator yeah. Cuff, huh? So yeah, you were out like all season long. I saw. Yeah. Uh, that that was probably the the biggest the the worst injury you had. That was the beginning of the end. Uh, yeah. I was already right. 33 or 34 years old, and to come um, back that late in my career. Um, I ended up making it back. I, I took the I 2010 that. season off and then actually got back to the big leagues in 2011, but just something wasn't right. My internal rotation was really bad. I was stuck at five degrees. If anybody knows internal rotation about mm -hmm. 45 degrees is a, is a pretty good uh, uh, flexion, but I was stuck at uh, five degrees. So I had to actually have a quality of life surgery done called a capsule release where they actually went in and then snipped the ligament. So I would gain flexibility back in my shoulder. And after that, my, you know, 88 to 90 mile an hour fastball went to about 78 mile an hour, <laughs> miles an hour. <laughs> and I rehabbed back and I got my fastball back up to about 85, I would say. Yeah. And that's actually when I went over and played in Italy. Uh, yeah. I was feeling good enough, but I couldn't compete at the major league level anymore. And I always wanted to go play over in Italy. And that's mm -hmm. when I joined the, uh, the team in Rimini. So yeah, that was, so that, that was one of the best experience of my life. That was great. Was it really? It really was. It really okay. was. Because I was going to yeah. ask you, like, the Italian League, I mean, I, I consider the Italian League, like, level-wise, it's pretty good. Uh, it's, maybe it's not as good as, like, you know, fan-wise and stuff like that. 
No. Uh, but I mean, was it was it fun to you? Oh, it was great. Yeah. I mean, there there was some downtime as well. I think we practiced. Yeah. Uh, we practiced on Tuesday, Wednesday games, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then we mm-hmm. were off Sunday. Maybe something on Monday, but yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty lax. Four games a week. Uh, I would pitch two out of those four games a week. <laughs> I yeah. pitched on Thursday, and then the back end game on Saturday. Um, but it was great. I mean, we were right on the beach. Uh, yeah, had a really little apartment. Mean. They gave me a car. Uh, hanging out with guys like Seth Lafera. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually that. That's the city where I live. I live in Rimini, so I'm not oh, okay. so far from the stadium. I'm like ten minutes away from the stadium. Great uh, and now I don't know if you know, but like Rimini is not even a team anymore. They oh, no, no, from, yeah, yeah, from last year. So I kind of, uh, you know, I had a lot of history as a team, but now they they don't have it anymore. So it's a shame, but. Uh, glad. Was, was that because Prez passed away? Did his passing yeah. have something to do with it? Yeah, Prez passed away, and the guy that came in after that didn't really do a good job, and then it just kind of like you know everything just kind of stopped like that. Uh, so you know, but but it's okay. And now we only play two games a week, so we we even have more downtime. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, man. So once you were done uh, playing, um, then you took like a year off I guess from baseball because then in 2014 that's when you started being a pitching coach again right correct I actually had a regular job I was okay in, yeah I was uh, I was installing smart boards in uh, mm-hmm. universities and colleges and stuff so I go around and, and install uh, LCD monitors and smart boards and then I actually coached high school baseball for my alma mater out oh, here wow. in Havertown yeah so that was my first coaching experiences with a high school baseball team okay and How then, was going back to normal life after, like, you know, oh, I was, it was, ter- it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> I, I, I needed to get back into not only just baseball, but professional baseball. I mean, I, I, I really like the environment. Um, you know, the, the time you spend with the players uh, yeah. is valuable to me. You know, I, I went to that mentorship role now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I played for 14 years. So whatever I can give these younger players, as far as experience on my end is crucial to their development. So it's, it's been really cool the past seven years to really kind of, you know, find out, you know, where these guys are from, what kind of makes them tick, uh, build them up with confidence, um, watch them, watch them struggle and fail and then pick themselves back up. And sometimes we have to pick them back up, but to, uh, to go through that process is, uh, is pretty cool. And um, I really, I really like what I do. I really do. I hope baseball yeah. would come back. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, because okay, 2014, 2015, and 16, you were a pitching coach for the Pirates, right? I was. I uh, go ahead. No, no, no. And then uh, now, the last three years, you've been with Miami. I switched. Um, so for the first three years, I was with Pittsburgh. I had a pitching coordinator uh, leave and go over to Miami, and I basically followed him over to Miami. His name was. I um, philosophy with, with Pittsburgh, uh, they, they, I don't think they do it anymore, but they kind of ran their organization like the military, which uh-huh. I wasn't really kind of into. So I, I figured I'd, I'd do a, a lateral move over to, to the Marlins and then follow my pitching coordinator over there, who's since not with us anymore. He's in Chicago. <laughs> so you're going to have um, to go to Chicago now. <laughs> no, Derek, Derek Jeter bought the, uh, bought the team a few years ago, and that transition from the old regime to the new regime – uh, has been has been really cool to see, and I like the direction the organization is going in. Okay, yeah, I'm really happy right now. That's cool, man. What's your approach with like all? I mean, you have so many different guys, you know, that you have to coach. Like, do you just kind of like wait and see what kind of players are them, and then try to you know uh, say always, something if there's a need or? Yeah, we. I have an open door policy. If anybody has a question, no, no, no questions. A stupid question. I think uh, the the Pirates used to have a 30 day policy, to, hmm. so we could really get to know the players. We couldn't work with them for the first 30 days that we got to know them. We were all, we were always building information, this and that. I think with the Marlins, we kind of do the same thing. It's not as lengthy. Uh, we don't just jump right in. Uh, we we, we want to kind of figure out how this guy learns. Uh, is he a guy that you know learns by doing, or can you just have a conversation? Um, so just kind of. Knowing his background, you know, where he's from is, is huge. Is he a high school? Is he a college guy? Hmm. Uh, that means a lot. It seems like more college guys mentality-wise are a little bit yep. stronger. Um, 
the, the high school guys, you got to kind of build them up a little bit better. Um, you know, so the failure part of it, don't let them kind of wear that too long um, and really kind of harp on, you know, the positives, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you're always hunting the good stuff, always hunting the good stuff. And I've had really good managers in the past that have uh, helped me along that way. Sometimes we'll, if a kid is struggling, we'll, we'll bring him in and sit him down and be like, Hey, we've been there. We went through yeah. whatever you're going through right now. We've also been through it. So you'll, you'll, you'll come out of this if you're struggling. And if they get a little too cocky, we always say, you know, it's only a matter of time before you get humbled in this game. You know, <laughs> yeah. You're not going to, if, if you don't, you're probably in the big leagues and making millions and millions of dollars. But at some point, you will be humbled in baseball. Somebody's going to get you. You're going to go through a stretch uh, where you're feeling pretty down. And then, and then now what? What do we do from there to kind of get you back? So baseball yeah. goes in stages. There's, there's that ebb and flow of the game. We just right. got to stay right in the middle. Those are all good points. And, you know, uh, I, I played baseball too, uh, been in the minors and all that. I ended up in Japan too. Um, I started Dominate, this is the name of the company, uh, yeah. because because I feel like baseball is such a mental game and yeah. Dominate, it's related with, you know, being able to dominate your mind through all the up and downs that you were talking about. Uh, and the tagline is the Yogi Berra sentence, which is 90% mental. Um, so, yeah, like, what do you guys do, like, men like mentally? Like, how do you guys prepare... Uh, your pitcher, like, you know, under that uh, aspect of the game? Like, do you have, like, uh, mental coaches that work with them? Or... Not as the Pirates had a huge mental conditioning program. The Marlins, mm -hmm. uh, they have a few guys that come around. Um, I don't think it's as intense, but there are guys there that, that will help if, uh, if you need it. As far as my job mentally with these guys to prepare them, uh, a lot of the, the work that we do to prepare, prepare ourselves and to get confidence building into the next game is done in our bullpen sessions, mm -hmm. especially for the starting pitchers is to build that confidence, whatever we needed to work on or, or whatever failures you had the game before now's the time to address it in, in our bullpen sessions, whether it's, you know, your secondary pitch, fastball location, whatever. So, you know, we crunch, we crunch video. We look yeah. at video all the time to kind of, you know, see if there's a mechanical issue. And if there's not, and it's more just, you know, this between the lines, you know, we'll, we'll have guys stand in, you know, if they're, if they're struggling against left-handed hitters with fastballs in and they, they, they get kind of, you know, to that point, they don't want to hit anybody. We'll put a dummy in there, but we'll try to get like, you know, able bodies in there just so they can feel uh, what it's like to kind of hit that spot with, with, a, with a hitter in there. Uh -huh. Repetition, man. Repetition and repetition. It just it builds consistency in this game. Um, I, I just yeah, feel that everybody everybody can accomplish anything. Sometimes this kind of keeps us from doing that. Yeah, I'm sorry about the bells. I live close to a church. Oh, nice. Seven seven thirty. It just goes off. So every time I have my lives, there's this bell like <laughs> okay. going off at some point. Uh, so the game is been changing a lot i bet you know since yeah. you were playing the game do you think it got better like do you like this new uh, way to play the game or you kind of like miss the old you know the old <laughs> way that you, you used to be part of there's something to be said about the old way uh i guess the old school way of baseball yeah. where you know it was i think that the coaches were a little not harder but they were a little bit more like real like they could actually talk to you like hey you need to do this, 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 and this if you want to make it to the big leagues. Now there's data and information yeah. uh, on it. Not to say that we're not real and true to our players, but um, there's that kind of fine line where if we're, are we telling them too much? You know, especially at my level. You know, we, we're always constantly trying to build confidence, so we don't really want to tear down, you know, the player too, too much. If he's a, yeah. you know, an upper-level guy – not an upper-level, but an older guy at my level, like 23, 24, he probably should be somewhere else – I could be a little bit more, okay, we got to get going on this. But for the most part, uh, you know, the way the old school approach was and, and, and now the kind of analytics, we had all these analytics back, back in the day, like with spin rates. We all seen 88, 89 mile an hour fastballs that guys couldn't hit up here. Guy probably yeah. had a high spin rate. Now they're just putting a value on it. Right, so, right. There's all these names now, huh? Now we have TrackMan data. What we try to do is – 
we try to, if they throw a four seam and a two seam fastball, we have data on which one gets hit the most. We have the vertical and the horizontal movement. We have, we grade each pitch out. So we can actually put a value and a grade on each pitch and see where that, we have this, um, this chart basically that we use and where that pitch uh, is on the chart. And we call it the watermelon chart because it's, you know, the colors of the watermelon. So in the red, we yeah. want to avoid that red area right there. That, that pitch right there is going to get hit probably 80 to 90% of the time. And once we start getting into the green, the outer scope of it, those are the swing and misses pitch. So we actually have algorithms now that break down each pitch type and we can tell whether that thing is a good pitch, it can get hit or won't get hit, or if that thing is flat over the zone and it can get crushed. So that's crazy. You think that there is value in it? There really is. There's value, huh? Or at some point, isn't it even too much? Like maybe like a pitcher could get like all like you know messed up it, it, in his mind, I guess, about all that, right? It could get overwhelming for sure. Uh, absolutely. I think the one of the coolest things that has um has come along was the slow motion, the edutronic camera that okay. basically slows down the hand. And you can actually see finger placement on breaking balls, fastballs, two seamers, change ups and everything. So it's been huge with, um, with pitch development. So now we can really structure hand placement on pitches by slowing the ball down and seeing where his release point is. So that's been huge with my job as well. That's awesome. Um, so, uh, going back to your career, you know, unfortunately, um, you had a few injuries. Um, do you think injuries just happen? Or like, like, for example, you, you think you could have a, had a chance to like avoid uh, your injury or at some, you know, sometimes it just happens, like even if you kind of take care of yourself? It's a great question. I always thought that I had a, a pretty good delivery that yeah. would would warrant me pitching for a long time. And I did pitch for a long time, but I did it. I did pitch through a few injuries. They always shit. They always say when you have a shoulder injury, it's usually due to overwork or overuse or just, you know, I've been pitching since I was eight years old. You know, yeah. I had my first shoulder surgery when I was 24, 25. So, you know, that's a long time. And they say if, you know, you, you've logged – as a starter, if you've logged a lot of innings from when you were even in high school, college, to the professionals, and, and you haven't had a surgery, you're pretty lucky. So I, I just think that was just, you know, wear and tear over the years with my first shoulder surgery, which was my labrum. So they went in. They cleaned it up. Um, I guess, you know, you, you talk about, like, uh, how many sutures you put in for a complete tear on the, uh, on the, um, on the labrum. I think five or six is a complete tear. I had five. So <laughs> mine was almost completely torn. Took me about six months to rehab through that. When I came back, I, I, I was pretty strong. I think I was throwing a little bit harder. Yeah. I was 90 to 94 before surgery. Then I was 88 to 91, 92-ish. So I, I dropped a few miles an hour from when I was in college in my first few years in pro ball. Um, and then it lasted, that surgery lasted me about nine years. And then <laughs> the rotator cuff went. Uh, right after that. So I wouldn't change my, my path for anything. I think yeah. rehabbing through that, uh, there's a mental strain on you, uh, just a rehabilitation from an injury, which, yeah. you know, kind of kept me going. So I was mentally tough from that going through my career. So I guess when it came time to, you know, play an independent baseball and think my career was over, I look back on, you know, that year in 2001, where I pretty much rehabbed most of the year from that surgery. And I was like, you know what? I can do this. That was a down time that year. This is a down time this year. Next year could be different. Uh, if I didn't get picked up the following year, I probably would have thought about retiring again, but I ended up getting yeah. picked up. So it's just trying to put yourself in, in the best position for opportunity. And for me, it was always going back down to Mexico to see if I could find jobs. I met a, uh, I met a pitching coach who became my AAA pitching coach his name was Stan mm -hmm. Kyles and who actually became my pitching coach in the big leagues with the with the Brewers I was pitching for Obergon in the 2006 season and I got traded in Mexico to um the Hermosillo not in Hermosillo, yeah. yeah yeah Hermosillo so I actually got traded in Mexico and I ended up with Hermosillo uh an old manager of mine Lorenzo Bundy uh was the manager on the team and then Stan was the pitching coach and Here's a kind of a funny story because 
I always competed well in Mexico and I always found jobs. And the Phillies came to me and offered me a contract, verbally offered me a contract. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling all these teams that are inquiring about me that I'm signing with the Phillies. Well, after the new year, because I was down there through the new year, uh, I came, uh, we got back to playing and I contacted the Phillies and they weren't interested anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they said they ended up signing Kane Davis instead, uh, another right-handed pitcher. So then I told the pitching coach, Stan Kyles, this, and he's like, hey, let me make a phone call. So the very next day, uh, we went out to dinner, and he congratulated me. He's like, hey, the Brewers are wow. going to – and that was history because I ended up making it to the big leagues. That was my first time uh, with that team. So I actually – you know, I love Stan. He, he's a great guy. He was looking out for me. But if he didn't do that, if he didn't make that phone yeah. call, my career would have been way different. Yeah, man, it's crazy. Like, I've been doing a lot of interviews uh, lately. And almost all the guys, actually, um, they play at big league level. And all the stories they have, they're so interesting. Like, everybody, like, have a different path. Absolutely. But they're all so, like, sometimes they're like, no way that happened. Like, that's how you got to the bigs. That's unbelievable. So, yeah. it's pretty crazy. Talking about that, like, you as a pitching coach, that's your goal, like, going back to the bigs? Or you actually like to work with young players, like, in the minors and try to get them there? I actually, <clears throat> when I first started out, I uh, I really thought I would make a great big league pitching coach. Um, uh -huh. I think that's everybody's aspirations when they first start a job. You want to get to the highest level yeah. of anything you want to do. I think now that I've had seven years in player development and, you know, I've been in A-ball, you know, pretty much ever since, mm -hmm. I really like the development side of what I do. I get these guys when they're young. I yeah. can hold them a little bit more, not only from a physical standpoint with deliveries and looking at video, but from a mentality standpoint, because I know I've, you know, I've been through the mill. I spent 10 years in the minor leagues before I got, <laughs> you know, my opportunity to compete. And, um, you know, just to have that there for them and be like, hey, when you think things get tough, this was my journey. And I'm not saying that you can't do it. You very well can do it. And honestly, you have probably better stuff than I do. You'll probably be in the big leagues way before 10 years <laughs> but just to just to be able to give them that i think has been great and and i, I really like you know getting them when they're young and really molding them the way we, we've been doing yeah man um yeah you're at that level like you said uh you know a ball that's when you can actually work on guys maybe when you get to double and triple already they're already you know maybe <laughs> some of them things they already know everything maybe you know not do, all of do you remember do you remember a coach you had when you were really young that was very influential on you oh yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah. i had a few uh, yeah yeah that's good uh, yeah uh actually in able i had a puerto rican guy that you know helped, helped me out a lot yeah that's probably right. one of the best pitching coaches i had but yeah man there you go yeah all very interesting um thank you so much also for you know uh taking your time i'm actually gonna put this um uh, this interview on my YouTube channel too. Uh, Wonderful. That that way people can can go and watch it. There's a there's a lot of good uh, knowledge and uh, is I that really dominate appreciate. as well? Is that dominate? Yeah, well? yeah, yeah. Okay. It's dominate baseball. Uh, I'm gonna send you the link just in case you wanna you wanna watch yourself again. <laughs> okay. uh, but no, man, uh, I don't wanna take too much time out of you. Thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Um, great probably question. gonna. Yeah, I'm probably gonna write a, a post about it too, because there's there's so many things that could be helpful. Maybe in Italian too, be helpful for like all the young pitchers here. Um, so thanks again, man. Definitely keep in touch again. Thanks for having me. I appreciate. You never that. know what happens. Small world, right? Baseball know, world, right? small world. Absolutely. Yeah. So be good, and yeah, hopefully the quarantine is gonna is gonna be over soon. It has to. Hopefully, yeah. you know, in the next month or so. Hopefully, everything's back to normal. Sounds good, Mike. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. All again. right, buddy. Good seeing you. Okay. You All have right. a good one. See you. You too.